Um, today, kind of to sum up some of the, uh, the information uh, that you've gotten today, I wanted to kind of walk through what it's like to build your first application on top of Cassandra. So you kind of got a little bit about data modeling, you've learned a little bit about uh, languages, you've learned a little bit about how to monitor things in production, maybe how some of the internals work and, and everything like that. So what's it like to actually build, a, build an application? And so um, I didn't get a chance to do this earlier, so I'll probably do it at the end of the day instead of the beginning of the day, but um, kind of introduce myself and sort of my background and what maybe why I'm giving this talk. So uh, I'm a language evangelist, which is a totally made up title. Uh, language part of my title basically means that uh, I focus on a particular community, in my case, the .NET community. Uh, so I'm a long time developer. I've been writing applications for like 15 years now. And I recently got a chance to co-present at, uh, at the Cassandra Summit in San Francisco. So I don't know if anybody went to the Cassandra Summit in San Francisco. Uh, we're doing it again this, this next year, I think, in San Jose. Uh, but I got to co-present at Microsoft, which was kind of cool. But I tell you that so that I can show you this picture of what I think most people thought about Microsoft being a presenter at the Cassandra Summit. It's a big, like, it's a big open source conference. You know, like you don't get a ton of Windows <coughs> machines there. It's mostly Linux and Mac and you know, that kind of thing. But uh, all is well now, right? Like in the, in the Microsoft landscape, I don't feel like quite the pariah being the that guy anymore. Like with all the great stuff that has been coming uh, out of MS lately with the open sourcing of the .NET framework and. Uh, and they certainly still have a long ways to go. The community of developers is great, has been for a long time, but it's cool to see Microsoft kind of turn the corner as well. <coughs> so this is what we're going to talk about. I mentioned this earlier in my, uh, my talk. It's called Killer Video. It's a, it's a video sharing web application. So think about YouTube, basically. It's a YouTube competitor uh, or YouTube clone, if you, if you prefer. Uh, users can add videos. They rate them. They comment on them. Uh, you can search for videos by tag, that kind of thing. I think everybody kind of knows YouTube at this point. Uh, there's a live demo available at www.killervideo.com. That's killer without an e, uh, video.com. Uh, it's written in C Sharp. That live demo is running in Azure on the Data Stacks Enterprise cluster, uh, live in the, in the Azure cloud. Uh, it's totally open source. You can go to my GitHub and grab it, even if you're not a C Sharp developer. Uh, you know, if you're looking for just some schema examples of what kind of like CQL uh, looks like, it originally was a CQL schema, was all of this. So my boss, Patrick, used to take the CQL schema around and show it to people that were kind of learning the standard to kind of show off some of the data model, different data modeling techniques and how it's different maybe than, uh, than relational database modeling. So check that out. It's also an interesting use case, not just to show off data modeling uh, you know, kind of techniques, but it's also kind of cool if you think about the scale that something like a YouTube operates at. Um, so I put some stats from, from YouTube up here. More than a billion unique users each month. Uh, 100 hours of video are uploaded to the site uh, every minute to YouTube. The scale must just be enormous if you were if you were really going to build something like this to compete with YouTube. The scale would be pretty awesome. So you probably have lots of machines. Uh, this might be a great use case for something like Cassandra. Probably multiple data center. Uh, it's just it's a good use case from that perspective as well. So this is uh, this is kind of how we're going to go through it. We're going to talk a little bit about things to do before you get data modeling. Then we're going to talk about the actual data model itself. Uh, then we'll talk about the application, so maybe sum up uh, some of the stuff that you saw in John's talk about Python, and, and kind of talk more, more broadly about other languages as well, because I know everybody's not a, a Python developer, myself. Uh, software architecture, we'll talk a little bit about kind of what's going on uh, architecturally with the site, and uh, just because I love software architecture. And uh, the future as well, so kind of, since we built this thing on Cassandra, what are some directions, some different directions we can take this application, take this demo, and kind of run with? Some other interesting things maybe we could we could do with it in the future. <coughs> so first, let's talk about thinking before you model, and I call this for how to keep doing what you're already doing. And that's because uh, a lot of the stuff that you do, I, I think, uh, when we took the poll earlier, most people had relational database experience. A lot of the stuff that you're doing when you when you're building an application on top of a relational database, you should keep doing it. Like a lot of it still applies. So first thing is getting to know your data. So what are the things? Uh, what are the things that I have in the system? What uh, What are the relationships between these things? Uh, this is also a lot of times referred to as sort of conceptual data modeling. So, what are my entities? A lot of times, this is entities and relationships between uh, entities. And you already do this. So, uh, if you're already doing this in, in the relational database, well, keep doing it. There's no reason why you shouldn't think through. You know, what are the things I'm going to have in, in my system, and, and how are they going to relate to each other? So you might, uh, you might end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, anybody seen a chain notation diagram before? Like, anybody glaze over when they see a diagram like this? 
So, like, I for the longest time as a developer, like, thought anytime I would see something like this, I would be like, okay, this is like obviously the purview of the DBA or the database architect or you know, like somebody that does database stuff for a living. This is their job to produce diagrams like that. Uh, if you've never seen them before, basically a generation diagram. Uh, the big boxes there are some of the entities, some of the things that we've got, so users and comments and videos. Then we've got kind of the relationships between them and the diamonds here. So you know, a user, they post comments and the user adds videos to the site. We even labeled them one to many and many to many, you know, kind of label the size of the relationship. And then the, the circles or the ovals there are just attributes about those entities. So, you know, a user has the first name and a last name and an email address, that kind of stuff. And that double circle down in the bottom, uh, bottom corner there, you've never seen one of these before, is basically a collection of related things. So videos, when they get added to the site, this is a, they get tagged, so we let, we let users go ahead and add, like basically categorize them, kind of add tags that are keywords that are appropriate for them. So videos have tags, they have this collection of tags associated with them. So even if you're not doing a chat notation diagram, even if you're not doing something this formal, uh, if you're doing it on a whiteboard or you're doing it on a cocktail napkin while you have beers with your team, whatever it is that you're doing, uh, keep doing it, that's absolutely useful. So once you kind of figure out, okay, what are the things in the system, you know, how do they relate to each other, then you want to start thinking, okay, what are my workflows? And again, this is something that you are absolutely already doing. You're not going to build an app, uh, you know, a web app or a mobile app or whatever it is, or a service, uh, whatever it is. You're not going to build it without knowing why am I building this? What are people going to do when I, when I build this? You know, how am I going to, how are people going to use this thing? And so absolutely keep doing that. So from this, once you start thinking about workflows, how are people going to, how are people going to use the, the site or the app that I'm building? Uh, from this, you'll a lot of times you'll figure out you know, how, how am I going to access the data. So queries, which is really our ultimate goal with Cassandra Data Modeling, figuring out the queries, will kind of fall out of these workflows uh, that you figure out for the site. And again, knowing your queries in advance is not optional with Cassandra because we don't have some of the tools uh, at query time, some of the flexibility that we get at query time with the relational database with joins and subselects and aggregations and stuff like that. We don't have those tools in Cassandra. So this is what it looks like for, uh, for our video sharing site for Killer Video. This is an example of some of the workflows we've got going on. So if we start like at the top left corner, user shows up at the site, they're going to log in, and then we go down to the bottom there, like, we might want to show them their profile information, so show them some basic profile information, maybe show them the videos they've posted to the site, show the comments that they've added to the site, you know, to various videos on the site. And then in the top right hand corner there, we've got uh, some more of the video-centric kind of workflows. So user shows up at the site, they're probably going to search for a video by tag, or we may want to show them like a list of the latest videos, like here, here's the latest stuff that's been added to the site. And then from that, they can kind of choose an individual video. And once they click on a video, then we're probably going to want to show the video and its details, be able to actually like play it back for them, like, like you can on YouTube. Um, show the comments, so you know, here's, here's the latest comments. And then also show ratings, so we kind of got like a one to five star, like Amazon, Netflix kind of style uh, rating system on there as well. So we might want to show like, here's how many people have rated it, and here's the average rating. So again, once you kind of have those workflows, a lot of times what you'll find out is that there's sort of a one-to-one -one correlation between the workflows on your site and the queries that you need to do. So I, here I've kind of tried to group the workflows by sort of like what entity they deal with. So you can see we've got two different ways, two different workflows related to users and two different ways essentially that we need to query user data. So when a user logs into the site, we're probably going to want to look them up by email address and verify their password is correct and whatnot to, to log them in. But then when we want to show basic profile information about a user, then we'll probably be looking them up by ID. That'll probably be some sort of find, find a user by ID. And so you see two different ways to, <coughs> to query comments data as well. Uh, ratings, there's just one way to look at it. And then with videos, there's actually a bunch of different ways we want to query this video data, right? So finding by tag, finding by ID, showing the latest ones, that kind of thing. So now that we've kind of got uh, now that we kind of got this idea of conceptual data modeling and we got that out of the way, we kind of thought about our data, we figured out our workflows, and now we know uh, from our workflows we know our queries. Now we can go about actually building a data model, and uh, I call this a data model for cat videos because everybody knows that the internet loves cat videos, and if we were really building YouTube, that would be like ninety percent of the traffic we serve probably. <clears throat> and if you're curious, just how popular if you're curious, I know I was just how popular cats are on the internet. So of course, this being the internet, somebody had already done the research for us, and uh, so these are these are from a national uh, national infographic from 2013. So this is this was looking at how many uh, 
monthly Google searches there are for cat videos. So it's like something like 31 million for cats and almost three quarter of a million for cat videos. And it was funny, they're actually looking at cats and bacon and how popular cats and bacon were. And I was like, that's funny because the IT crowd loves bacon for some reason. But ask John later what he thinks about bacon, and you will get an enthusiastic response, I guarantee. And then this is the bottom half of the infographic, and there's like two things I wanted to point out here. So first, the keyboard cat uh, statistics. So keyboard cat video, everybody seen the keyboard cat video before? It's like, uh, it says here 31 million views. These, are, these stats are a little bit out of date, but if you go and look now, keyboard cat actually has over 37 million views since it was uploaded in, uh, in 2007. And if you do the math, that averages out to about 13,000 views a day, or one view every nine seconds which just kind of reinforcing again the scale of something. This is for a single video, right? So like, the scale of something that something like YouTube must operate at is pretty impressive. The other thing that I thought was funny was the Grumpy Cat stat. So they said Facebook, uh, the Facebook page for Grumpy Cat has over a million fans, and that's twice that of Nick Cage, which I thought was kind of interesting. <laughs> so let's talk about data modeling again. So we're going to build the data model. Uh, so Cassandra limits us to queries that can scale across a cluster, right? So uh, we're always going to include a value for our partition key and optionally clustering columns uh, if we can. And we know our queries, so we're going to follow this sort of table per query sort of pattern. We're going to build tables to answer queries similar to this idea of, uh, of materialized views from, from the relational data database world. And we're going to try to denormalize at write time so that then come read time we can do, uh, we can do reads as efficiently as possible. So let's look at uh, let's look at those two users use cases for example. So we got users. We want to look them up by email address, and we want to find them by ID. Those are the two queries we need to run. So if we're in a relational database, right? We probably have a single users table, and that single users table would have a primary key of uh, some some ID of some kind, and that would be enough to take care of our second query of, of being able to find users by ID. And then to do the second query, where we need to find uh, the first query, I guess, of there to find a user by email address, we probably just Use a secondary index, we add, add an index to the email address column, and we call it a day. All, all is well and good. The problem though, like once we, uh, you know, maybe we built the most popular application ever, and, uh, and all of a sudden all our users usually are signing up so fast that it won't fit on one machine anymore until we spend a whole lot of money to scale our machine up. Or we decide, hey, it would be really great, like it's really important that people be able to log into the site. And this single box that we're keeping all the user data on, like that's a pretty bad single point of failure. If that ever goes down, like users won't be able to log into the site, and that's bad. Like we're not making money when that happens. So then you might start thinking, okay, well maybe I should use something like Cassandra. And so how you know we got the single users table in the relational database model. This is what it would look like. This is what it might look like inside of Cassandra. So the table on the right, the users table there, probably looks pretty much like what you would expect in the relational database. So you've got a primary key of user ID, so that we can do lookups of, of users by ID. So that's that entity, and we call it an entity table in the data model we talk. Then we've got a second, uh, we've got a second table called user credentials, and that one you can see as a primary key of email address, so that we can do lookups of users based on their email address. And again, you see there's some data duplicated between the two tables. So for example, email address is in both tables, user ID is in both tables, and that's okay. When, uh, when users sign up for the site, we'll be doing probably a batch inside of Cassandra to insert data into both of those tables, and uh, it's okay. It's hard, it's hard to get your mind around. This whole third normal form is it's not the way to do it, but uh, that's the way we do it in Cassandra. And we don't always duplicate all the data, so that's very much driven by the query requirements, right? So what data do I actually need to support that workflow or support that query? Like, we don't need the user's first name and last name when we're verifying their password. Log into the site when we look up by ID. Here's another example. So we got videos, right? We said there was like all kinds of different ways we wanted to query videos. So you can see we've got a videos table, again, sort of an entity table. It's got a primary key of video ID. It'd be really easy to look videos up by ID. Uh, then we also have the table to be able to find uh, find videos by user. So we want to show, you know, hey, hey, here's the latest videos this user has added to the site. And you can see we've got a primary key of user ID, and so that we'll store all of their videos together in a partition. And then we've got added date video ID combined as the, uh, as the clustering columns. And you can see we're taking advantage of it with clustering order by again, because we decided, hey, when we query this, we're probably going to be doing, hey, give me the 10 latest videos for this user, give me the latest videos for this user. So we're doing with clustering order by added date descending. So we're saying sort of in reverse time order, because we're always going to want the latest ones first. 
So this has come up a few times today. Um, so here's two more of the video, video use cases. Uh, I'm not going to show you the schema form again. It's open source. Uh, you can absolutely grab this on my GitHub if you're interested in the schema form. You can probably guess. You know, you guys have seen enough. Uh, I think everyone here has seen enough at this point to kind of guess what the schema would look like. But keep in mind these considerations for duplicated data. And I know I've said it a few times today. But if you go down this path of making multiple copies of your data, of denormalization, you need to start thinking, okay, can the data change? And if it can change, how often or how likely is it to change? Or how frequently, I guess, will it change? And then, then you have to start thinking about, okay, do I need to maintain consistency or integrity across all these copies? You might be in a scenario where you don't need to, right? So it might be totally fine. And some of these, uh, some of these copies are out of sync. But if you do need to maintain integrity, then you need to start asking yourself, okay, do I have a way to actually go and update all these duplicate copies of, of data? So it's always good to have a plan, uh, especially when you start going down this path of denormalization and making duplicate copies. You got it in the back of your mind. So let's talk a little bit about uh, modeling relationships, and there's really two kind of examples I want to give. So the first is CQL collection types. So uh, I gave you the, some of the, showed you some of the syntax in my data modeling talk earlier. Uh, here's an example. So we said uh, when videos get uploaded to the site, users get to tag them with keywords, so they get to add sort of a small collection of, of tags. And so if you have a small collection of related things, and small being the keyword here. CQL collections can be really a, a really nice way to sort of model that. A good example of something that maybe isn't a small collection of related things would be, say, the comments on a video. Like we've already showed you, you know, if we put those in a separate table, but you can imagine the number of <coughs> comments on a video might get really, really large over time. So the number of related things to that video, not a small collection of related things, probably not a good, good use case for using CQL collections. So if you've got a small collection of related things, absolutely think about using a uh, think about using a secure collection to model that, and take advantage of them. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of client-side joins. So a lot of times, and this is actually the real data model right now inside a killer video, and a lot of times if you're coming from a relational database background, you'll be tempted to get into this normalization game, this third normal form kind of game again. And so here's an example of the view video page. The top of this, the screenshot here is from the view video page. And somebody actually clicks on a video, and we want to show them the details so we can play it back. And what happened was when I originally built the site and I originally did the schema, uh, for some reason, I didn't include the author's information on this page. So for some reason, I mean, it makes total sense to put the author's information on this page. I don't know why I didn't originally, but we had a designer come through and they like gave it a facelift and it was like, oh wow, like, yeah, it looks so much better now. And they actually put the like author, you know, the little avatar of the author and the, and the name of them of the author up on that page. And so with the schema that I currently have right now, what I have to do is I have to do a query to get the video data. And you can see we're storing the user ID of the, of the author there. But then once that query comes back, I've got to pull the user ID out of the data that comes back and then go do a follow-on query to the user's table where I load the user up by their user ID. And when you get in a situation where you're basically recreating SQL joins, but you're doing it in your app tier, you're, you're saying, eh, well, Cassandra won't let me do joins. I could just get around it by you know, kind of doing it manually in the app. Uh, you need to start thinking, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm doing something so you need to start thinking, what is the cost? And these might be okay in small situations. So like this example here where we're doing one query and then we're only doing one follow-on query to get user information, might be okay. But uh, these don't scale over the long term. So uh, avoid these, absolutely avoid these when possible if you, if you can. So what's, uh, what's some ways maybe that we could solve this instead? What are, what are some alternate data models to solve this problem? And I'm not sure how I'm going to solve it in the, in the demo application. At some point we will, I'm sure, but uh, it's such a good illustration of things not to do that I kind of left it in there for that purpose. So one possibility might be to alter the videos table. So you can see I've got three alter table statements up here where we're adding the columns for the user's first name, last name, and email address. We need their email address to, to uh, generate that pretty little gravatar picture of them. Uh, so we want to just put that data directly into the videos table, and then we, when we do our query against the videos table, we've got all the data that we need right there in the one table. The other option we have is we can create this user's by video table. So you can see we've got this second table here on the right where we've created a table full of the same user data. So we've got the user's first name, last name, email, but it's got a primary key of video ID. So it's 
you know, users buy the videos they've uploaded, user data by the videos they've uploaded. And you might say, okay, well, why is that solution on the right? Why is that any better? Like, why am I in a, any better situation? I still have to do a second query in that in that situation. Like, how is that any better than the solution you have now? The difference is that uh, the table on the right is keyed by video ID, and the videos table is keyed by video ID. So when we sh something shows up on the page, we can actually run those two queries in parallel. We're not doing one query, waiting for it to return so we can pull some value out, and then doing follow-up queries. This could actually be run in parallel with our query to get our video data. So anytime you're in this scenario where you're running queries in parallel, or you find yourself with a data model where, hey, I can run these in parallel, that's a really good uh, spot to be in. That's, that's absolutely it. So most of the data stacks drivers have async methods or, or futures-based uh, methods for being able to run queries in parallel and then kind of gather the results after you run them in parallel. So again, just to, just to kind of reiterate this, remember the considerations when you duplicate, when you duplicate data. So uh, you know, if I did do that scenario, uh, either of those scenarios where I end up duplicating the user information into another table, so what happens if a user changes their name or their email address? Uh, you know, I'm probably going to want to update that data on the videos page. Uh, how, how likely are they to change their name and email address? How frequently will that happen? You know, how frequently should we allow them to do that sort of thing? And do I have all the information I need to update those duplicate copies? So another thing that you'll run into with Cassandra, we didn't, I don't know if we've actually come up today, but another thing that you'll run into is sometimes Cassandra rules can sort of impact the design choices that you make. And Cassandra has a few finicky, uh, kind of funky rules maybe that you're not used to from, from uh, relational databases. So for example, video ratings. It would be really nice uh, if we're gonna track video ratings that we could use counter columns. So Cassandra has, has a column type called counter that's used to do approximate counts of, uh, of things. And so it would be really nice since we're always going to show the ratings data on the, you know, along with the video data to just put those columns directly into the videos table. So we'd be storing two things here. We'd be storing a, uh, a rating counter, which is basically how many people have rated a given video. You know, so every time somebody gives a rating, we increment it by one. And then we also have the ratings total column here, which is if somebody gives it five stars, we increment it five. If somebody gives it three stars, we increment it three. So we've got a total and we've got a count, we can figure out an average, right? Because we said we wanted to show an average on the, on the page. So unfortunately, the rules, uh, Sandra has rules about counters, and that rule is, uh, and, and I'll try and explain this clearly, the rule is if you have uh, columns, like these rating counter and rating total columns that are of type counter, then every other column that's in that table that has the counter columns, every other column has to be part of your primary. And that's kind of a weird rule uh, you know, that, that Cassandra has. So if we wanted to do this idea on the left where we put the counter columns directly in the videos table, we would have had to add name and description and user ID and all these other things. We would have had to add all of them to the primary key uh, to be able to satisfy that restriction that Cassandra has. So what you end up with instead is you end up with these, this idea a lot of times with counters in particular of counter tables. So you have the counters kind of in a table by themselves with a primary key of some kind. So again, we've got uh, video ratings. You can see it's got the two counter columns and it's got a primary key of video ID. And again, because it's key by video ID, when somebody shows up at this page, we can run this query in parallel with our query to go get the videos data because it's got the same, same video ID as, as its primary keys. Also a good place to be. Last thing I want to talk about as far as data model goes is this idea that uh, physical nodes have their limits as well. And this really comes down to choosing a partition key. So you can see we've got this query finding the latest, uh, finding the videos by date, where we want to show uh, we want to show sort of the latest videos added to the website. So you can see our create table statement here. We've got as the cluster I'm sorry, as the uh, as the partition key, we've got year, 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 month, month, day, day. So we're basically bucketing the, we're using as a partition key, we're basically doing it by day. And so the thing with the, the thing with this is that all reads and all writes, as people are adding videos to the site and people are reading back, hey, what are the latest videos that have been added to the site? For a given day, all the reads and writes are going to go to a single partition. And that means that all the reads and writes are going to go to a single node or set of nodes, or a replica set. And that can be bad, that could create a hotspot. We could absolutely end up overwhelming that machine uh, with the traffic. From, from all these reads and writes going to a single, uh, going to a single node. And you'll find this especially with, uh, anytime you try to use like anything time-based 
as part of the partition key, like that's a lot of times that's a signal that maybe you should start thinking about it. You know, that, hey, maybe, maybe I'm going to create a hotspot here. So what are some possible solutions to this? So really what we want to do is we want to spread the load out amongst more nodes in the cluster, right? So we need to do something to change the partition key, something to spread that load across other nodes in the cluster. And so we mitigate this by adding data to our partition keys. So this is the first example I think you've seen of this, uh, where we do a compound partition key. So I mentioned that you can do this. You'll see there's an extra set of parentheses in our primary key definition, where we're saying use you, 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 you month, month, day, day, plus some arbitrary bucket number in this, in this example here. So there's, there's really two ways that we can do this when we're adding data to the partition key. One might be to add some, some, part of, uh, some, some piece of data that's already naturally part of our domain. So let's say uh, instead of tags, like maybe when big people add videos to the site, we would make them categorize the video. We'd like have a pre predetermined list of categories. And they would pick from that list of categories which their video fell under. And then instead of showing the latest videos for the site, we might show like the latest sports videos or the latest technology videos or the latest Cassandra videos or whatever. And that might be enough by adding that category uh, to the partition key, that might be enough to sort of spread the load out enough that, uh, that we didn't create a hotspot. And then the other option is like in the example here, we can just add some arbitrary piece of data to it. So it could be a bucket number. In this case, we're just using an integer bucket number. And then we would round robin at the application level, at our, at our apps, uh, data access level. We would send reads and writes to different buckets in a sort of round robin fashion to kind of balance out the, uh, the load across the cluster. So two options. Keep in mind, you know, when you're choosing a partition key, uh, not only about partition sizes, but also, hey, you know, am I going to create a hotspot in, in my uh, in my cluster by doing this sort of partition key? So now let's talk a little bit about building the actual application itself. So you have kind of done conceptual data modeling. We've got um, you know, we've got physical data modeling that's going on with the with the site. Now let's talk. About what's it like to actually build an application? So John showed you Python earlier today. Um, awesome if you're a Python user or if you're new to programming and you're looking to, uh, absolutely, Python is awesome. These are uh, where we actually have drivers available. They're all open source. Uh, so these are official data stacks drivers that we have available on our GitHub. Um, they're all under Apache 2 license. Pretty much all the uh, all languages that you would expect. Uh, on the right hand side, there are some that will probably happen. So you know there have been some pretty pretty high level of talks and maybe some progress has even started on them behind the scenes. And then we've got some early discussions for Go and Rust. Um, they may happen and then it may not happen. Who knows, we'll see. Uh, but there's probably a driver up here for your language of choice. One of the interesting things about the official data stacks drivers, uh, one of the cool things, and I wasn't like, I didn't want to throw this, throw this up here to kind of like throw a wall of code in you. Like, so this is what it looks like to bootstrap the driver in four different languages, four of the different languages that I just kind of picked uh, because I can sort of do them. So uh, it's very, very similar. A lot of the same concepts apply across all of the across all of the data stacks drivers. So it's kind of cool because if you're somebody who works in multiple languages, you can take pick up and take a lot of the knowledge that you have in the language that you're using now and use Cassandra in another language and have a lot of the same concepts and a lot of the same knowledge that you already have about the driver apply in other languages as well. You'll see just how similar some of the, some of the bootstrap you know, code is, kind of cluster object, and this builder, and, you know, contact points, very, very similar. So I'm going to talk about three, um, it's three, yeah, three sort of features of the, of the driver that kind of apply, and the code samples that I show you will be in C-sharp, because killer video is in C-sharp, but, uh, but absolutely these, these ideas, these concepts apply to your language of choice as well. So the first thing is prepared statements, and I imagine John probably talked about these in his Python presentation this morning. But this is a performance optimization for queries that you're going to run over and over and over again. So if you think about it, uh, if you built built uh, say web applications or applications before or services, uh, a lot of times even when we're building against a relational database, we'll be running the same queries over and over and over again, just with different variable values. So if you've ever done any parameterized SQL in your code, where it's like, hey, I'm going to put a placeholder here in my SQL, and then I'm going to bind, I'm going to run the same statement over and over again, just with different variable values every time. This is a similar, uh, for similar scenario in your applications when you're talking to Cassandra. So here's an example of what it looks like to select from the user credentials table. Like, so when somebody's going to log in and we want to look them up by email address, this is probably the query that we're going to run. 
And if you haven't seen this question mark before, that's just like in, uh, in SQL where we have, I think it's the at symbol in SQL Server, and it's uh, colon and Oracle as the placeholder for variable values. Um, question mark is what we use in CQL to be a placeholder value, like, hey, I'm gonna provide you a value for this later. So you can see select from user credentials where email equals some value I'm gonna provide. Now, when we do a prepared statement, uh, when we actually prepare the statement, so session by prepare in this case, uh, that's actually under the cover is going to do a round trip to Cassandra, and that's going to give Cassandra a chance to actually parse that CQL string that we sent over and figure out how it's been executed, do any sort of optimization that it can do, and then once it's kind of parsed and figured out all that out, it's going to cache it in the cluster and send us back some sort of unique identifier that ends up in the driver wrapped into one of these prepared statement instances that you get back. And the idea is that you're going to prepare once, so I'm going to pay this cost to do the round trip to let Cassandra figure out how to execute this thing once, and then with that prepared statement that comes back, I'm going to bind and execute against it many, many times. I'm going to run, run that statement over and over again, maybe with different variable values when I do. Uh, and Cassandra then doesn't have to do this, uh, this whole parsing of the CQL string, it doesn't have to figure out how to execute it. Uh, we don't have to send the CQL string over the wire. All we have to do is send the variable values over the wire. So it's a great optimization if you're going to uh, if you're going to be running the same statement over and over again just with different variable values. So absolutely uh, take advantage of these. Uh, I find that in a lot of the in killer video when I was writing killer video, this was like 95 percent of the of the statements that I wrote in the application were prepared statements because I was running the same thing over and over again. Um, one thing to remember though. Uh, people make this mistake all the time when they get started because prepared statements is something that doesn't really have an analog in the uh, in the relational database world. We see people will write these data access classes where they prepare and bind and execute, and prepare and bind and execute every time through this method. And if, if you're not doing the prepare once and then kind of saving it off and then using it and then doing bind and execute many, if you're preparing every time through, you're basically doing two round trips to the server, so you're actually going to get worse performance than you would if you were just executing using one of the other statements in the driver. So remember, prepare once, bind and execute many. Match statements, so this, this has certainly come up uh, multiple times today. So a um, couple things to know about match statements. First of all, what they aren't. Uh, so these are not a optimization to bulk load data. So a lot of times batches in other databases are used to kind of, hey, let's, let's bulk load some data, let's use a batch. Uh, not what they are for in Cassandra. I think we've mentioned this before, batches in Cassandra, log batches are used. When I'm going to do that denormalization, I'm going to write to multiple tables, and I want to guarantee that either both of the writes succeed or none of the writes succeed, <coughs> kind of thing. So you use these uh, when you want that sort of atomic guarantee. And you can mix and match, there's multiple statement types in the driver, so I, I mentioned prepared and bound statements, kind of showed that example. There's another one called simple statement, for example, in the in the C sharp driver, there's an analog in Java as well, where it's just kind of like, hey, I just want to execute this query real quick. You can mix and match in a batch the different, uh, the different statement types that are available to you in the driver. So this is going to be hard probably to read in the back, but uh, this is an example, and there's a couple things to call out, I guess, in this, in this example. This is a sample data access class that we've got that's powering our video catalog. And a couple things to call out. So first is that we're mixing and matching bound statements and, and simple statements in our batch. You can see what it's like to kind of do one up and, and add it to the batch, and that we can mix and match. The other thing is with C sharp. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, with C sharp with the, with the constructor, which is what that top method is, it's the constructor for that uh, for that class. Constructors are guaranteed to only run one time for a given instance of an object. Same thing I, I imagine in, in most programming languages as well. And so that's what we're actually doing our prepare. We're doing session dot prepare and providing the statement. So this is just one example of how you can do the prepare once and make sure that you only prepare once and then bind and execute many times. So one, one way to potentially do it. So last thing, and I know these have been mentioned a couple of times as well, um, so lightweight transactions. So these are, uh, this is sometimes referred to as linearizable consistency. Or if you're from a relational database background, you might know serial isolation level. So maybe you have multiple writers writing to the same table, and you want to make sure that writes don't step on each other. So you want to make sure that like two writes don't try to write conflicting records, you know, with the same sort of key to that. Um, so this is essentially a check and set operation. So under the covers, it's using Paxos. Um, it requires 
consensus uh, amongst nodes in the cluster. So it has a really a pretty high latency cost involved with it. I think I remember reading in the, in the blog post when we first announced these that it was something like four, at least a minimum of four round trips between the nodes of the cluster was required. And so you can imagine if you got to do four round trips, that's a lot of latency. So this tool is available to you when you need it, uh, but you're gonna pay a, you're gonna pay a performance penalty when you use it. Uh, so read the fine print, know it's available to you, but you certainly want to, wouldn't want to use it across everywhere in your, in your application. So the canonical example we always give is unique user accounts, right? So people are signing up for, users are signing up for killer video, and we want to make sure that two users don't sign up with the same uh, username or same email address at the same time. We want to make sure that they're unique. So this is what it kind of looks like to actually do that scenario in, uh, in killer video. So you do that insert statement, we're inserting into that user credentials table that we saw earlier. And we say email, password, and user ID, and you'll see at the end of the statement it says, if not exists, that if not exists syntax is one of the one of the ways uh, that you can trigger a lightweight transaction. It's some of the syntax uh, that you use to use a lightweight transaction. And so when you do that, you're basically saying, hey, insert this record if one with that same primary key doesn't already exist. So if one with that, that email address, because you'll remember this, this table was keyed by email address, insert this if somebody with that email address doesn't already exist. And what you'll actually get back from the driver is you'll actually get back a special column called square brackets applied. Uh, and that basically is just success or failure, a success or failure, true or false boolean that says whether or not your insert was successful or not. So this is a little different than a relational database where maybe you might expect you get an exception, like a primary key violation exception or a constraint violation exception or something like that. And once you get that value back, that true or false value, you could absolutely throw an exception if you wanted to, but is not going to do it for you. So, uh, so you'll just get back a true or false that indicates whether or not you were successful. So, Lastly, last kind of few things I wanted to talk about. Uh, so if you actually do go and check out the code uh, for Killer Video, I wanted to talk a little bit about the software architecture. And so uh, this is because for me it's a love story. I love, uh, I've always been fascinated by software architecture. Uh, you know, if I wasn't doing this evangelist job, I'd probably be doing an architect job somewhere. Uh, but I'm just going around not paid to be an architect. So take these, take, you know, take this if you're going to go look at the demo and, and check it out. Uh, take this as some knowledge, maybe to help you dig into what's going on. So this is kind of the logical architecture of what's going on with the, with the demo. So uh, top layer, we've got a web UI, HTML5, JavaScript, typical sort of thing that you've got. Then at the server level, we've got an ASP.NMDC app. So this is the thing that's actually serving up the web UI. Uh, it's uh, answering JSON requests and sort of routing them, uh, you know, typical sort of MDC style uh, web application. Then underneath that, we've got a sort of tier of services. So we've got uh, you know, video catalog and user management. This is just four of the services. Well, I think there's eight or nine total where things are kind of grouped together. Uh, and I'm trying to group them together sort of by business capabilities. So less about, less sort of about the entity involved than it is sort of what does it actually do for the site? What is the capability that it's providing in the site? So for example, the video catalog it keeps track of the available videos that are, that are there to view. Whereas the upload service, it handles processing of uploaded videos because you know, we're going to have to take them from some source format and convert them into something that can actually be played back in a web browser or a mobile device. So its job is to kind of do that storing and encoding and re-encoding and generating thumbnail previews, that kind of thing. On the bottom layer then, we've got, uh, we've got some of the infrastructure pieces involved. So we're using Ops Center, uh, which is a free managing and monitor, monitoring tool from Datastax for, for provisioning new Cassandra clusters, monitoring all the Cassandra clusters. You get this nice little web dashboard that kind of shows you like what's going on with your read and write throughput and what's, you know, so very, very nice to have, uh, very easy to like provision clusters as well, provision new nodes and add the cluster. We've got the actual Cassandra cluster itself, DSC powered, uh, that's actually storing all our app data, so user accounts, video metadata, and all that kind of stuff. And then we've got three, uh, three Azure services that we're using as well because the live demo was built uh, to run in Azure. So we're taking advantage of Azure Service Bus, which is just for PubSub messaging. So if you've ever used RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ or any take your messaging technology of choice, you've probably used PubSub messaging before. Same idea. Uh, Azure Storage, which is blob storage. So we actually need to store the video files and the thumbnails that, that are generated. You need to actually store those somewhere, so we store those in Azure Storage. And then we have Azure Media Services, which is this kind of cool thing that Azure has that's a finished service that will actually do re-encoding of videos and actually extract thumbnails from, uh, from videos and whatnot from, from 
finished files. So kind of a cool little piece of infrastructure as well. So if we look inside, like what's going on with the service? So let's look at some of the service, right? So we've got the video catalog. This, this thing's job is to track videos, right? Uh, track what's available to be played back. And so it stores metadata about videos in Cassandra. Uh, you know, things like the name, the description, where the thumbnails are located, where the video file itself is located. And then it also does stuff like uh, it publishes events about, hey, interesting stuff that happened inside the system. So it might say, uh, hey, a new YouTube video was added. Or hey, a new uploaded video. We just accepted a new uploaded video. Something like that. Then we have more complicated services as well. So we've got the, uh, we've got the upload service, for example, probably the most complicated one in the system. And so it handles, like I said, the processing and sort of re-encoding of, of uh, uploaded videos, you know, user submitted videos to the site. And so it's going to store data about uploaded videos uh, in Cassandra, stuff like where, is, where are the files getting uploaded to, like what's going on with the coding jobs, how far along are they, what's the status, that sort of thing. It's going to use Azure Storage again to store the actual raw files, so video files, thumbnail files, that sort of thing. Use Azure Media Services to do the re-encoding jobs and to extract thumbnails. And then it also uses Azure Service Bus to publish interesting events that are happening inside it. So hey, uh, that uploaded video that you sent me, it's published now, it's available for you. It's, it's ready to be played back somewhere. So it's very much an event-driven architecture. So if uh, anybody's familiar with EDAs, uh, you know, it's very much an event-driven architecture where only the applications ever send commands down to the, down to the services. Uh, services don't ever actually send each other commands. They all sort of interact via this event-driven style of messaging where we post them and if some service cares that something else interesting happened in another service, then it just subscribes to those events and it can kind of react and do what it needs to do uh, to change its own state. So this is nice because the things are very decoupled, right? Everything's kind of decoupled from, uh, from each other. We don't have services like calling, you know, so they're not temporarily coupled. Uh, it's kind of a cool, cool way to be. Uh, and it's also nice because the services now can be sort of scaled independently. They can be deployed independently of each other. Uh, they can be versioned independently of each other. So long as they uh, maintain the message contracts about what events they publish, this can all happen sort of independent of each other. And so if you've heard the term microservices, the new hotness right now, uh, microservices, uh, basically the idea is this, right? That we can version, uh, that we can version small deployment you know, units independently, that they can be deployed separately, that they can be scaled separately and whatnot. So it's kind of a cool place uh, to be architectural. And just to give you an example, what do I mean by services interacting with each other via events? So here's an example of the video catalog that says, hey, I added this new YouTube video to the catalog. And then you have two other services subscribing to that event, and they might say, suggest a video service, and say, oh, I need to figure out what videos to suggest for that new video that just got added to the catalog. Or you might have search that say, uh, I think I better index that, so that it starts showing up in the search results. So it kind of happens async. Uh, you know, each one kind of owns its own set of data. So last, the future. What are we going to, like, what can we do now that we've built this application on top of Cassandra, um, you know, we've got a pretty solid architecture, things can be scaled out really nicely, um, you know, where could we potentially take this application in the future? And so I don't know about you, but anytime somebody says the future, like I always think the future coming, you know, you know like the year 3000 sketch from, from coming to run. So, uh, so basically, the premise is like Conan and Andy sit or like they dress up in really ridiculous outfits. They're supposed to be from the year three thousand. They make ridiculous predictions about what it's going to be like in the year three thousand. And I thought this one because we were doing uh, because we were doing YouTube. I thought this was like especially appropriate. So I don't know if everybody might be able to hear this, but hopefully. Oh, no video, no audio. So we predicted that YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook would uh, would merge together to form one big time wasting app called U Twit Face. So what could we do? What are we going to do in the future with this application? Okay. So uh, what what some possibilities? Where could we possibly expand? So Spark or Azure Machine Learning uh, potentially for doing video suggestions. So right now it's very sort of manual process video suggestions. But it would be kind of cool to do like a Spark machine learning job maybe based on other stuff you've viewed or other people similar to you, what they've viewed, and maybe you could suggest videos for you. Uh, we can do video search via solar. So right now we're doing video search via tags. Like so, uh, you know, 
person puts in a tag and find all the videos basically that, that have that tag on them. But it might be cool to do sort of a full text search with the solar integration. Uh, we can do actors that store state in Cassandra. So uh, the upload service is an example of a pretty complicated service, like what's going on internally and sort of all the different things that are that we're monitoring with media services and everything. It might be cool to use the actor model to sort of uh, sort of model that instead and store the actual state of the actors inside of uh, inside of Cassandra. So we might use Akka.net, so Reduce.net, uh, which is a straight port of the Scala framework that uh, I'm sure JDM developers are familiar with, or Orleans, which is the new uh, actor framework. Virtual distributed data framework from Microsoft that they received open source on GitHub. And then the other thing we could do that might be cool, uh, we can actually store the file data itself inside of Cassandra. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Pythos project, but the Pythos project is basically an S3 compatible wire store. So uh, you can use any of the S3, Amazon S3 drivers that are available uh, and talk to Pythos. And it's a file store built entirely on Cassandra. So you could actually store your binary data and it takes care of chunking it up efficiently to retrieve the binary data in an efficient way. So kind of a cool, uh, cool open source project, Pythos. I think their website is like pythos.io or something like that. So check that out uh, if you're interested in a file store on top of this. And that's it. So that's what it was like uh, building my application, my first application on Cassandra. I've been doing this a little over a year now, so I still consider myself. <coughs> but if anyone has questions, we can absolutely take some questions now, and then there will be time, like I said, for Q&A. We're going to do like a dedicated Q&A session if anybody's interested uh, a little later as well. So, big question.